Welcome back everybody to day two, part one of Modern Fortran Basics. Uh, first, we'll go over a couple of the logistics. Um, you can find the links to the, the slides, the example and exercise materials, and the Q&A document uh, on the event website. So uh, we'll, we'll periodically drop a link to that in the chat as people are joining. But uh, if you've got questions and things, please go ahead and use the, the Q&A document to write down your questions. We'll be monitoring that pretty, pretty frequently and uh, responding to questions there. Um, so please use that for questions. Um, also, we've got a reservation uh, for some nodes on Perlmutter. So if you're following along, make sure and use that reservation again. Uh, we will periodically post the, the command for that in the chat as well. Um, but as a quick reminder, it's that S alloc uh, reservation fun day two, since we're on day two today. Um, and use the Ntrain account and the shared QoS. So, uh, so I've already I've already gone ahead and done that on, on my side. Um, so let's go ahead and get into the discussions. Uh, the agenda. So <clears throat> yesterday for day one, we've already gone over some of the the compiler messages, uh, modern declarations, and then kind of how to use some modern equivalents for for things you may have already been familiar with, with older style Fortran. Um, today, we're gonna start going into some of the newer features of the language and how you can start to make use of those, namely derived types and the parallel features of the language. Uh, later today, I'll show you one of the new tools that is, that is available, <clears throat> the Fortran Package Manager. And we'll talk a little bit about unit testing. And if we kind of, you know, are, going at a pace like we did yesterday where we are going to be able to make it through all of the materials I've, I've also got some some additional examples and exercises that we can co take a look at to start to look at how do we in like real world code start using some of these uh modern features and things so let's go ahead and get started uh derived types so Yesterday, all of the examples we were working with made use of just the intrinsic types, uh, reals, integers, characters. These are all types that the language defines. They're called intrinsic types. But as of Fortran 90 and then really kind of increasing its, its usefulness and functionality, uh, we, the language allows you to define your own types. So we'll talk a little bit about how you can do that. Uh, so a derived type is declared like this. We're, we're going to define a type. And it'll, it's a way to let you put relevant information together as a co coherent thing. So for example, if I want to define a, a meaningful type for representing a point in space, I might define it like this. I have a, I have a type. I call it point, And then... So it's type and then a name for the type. And then between that and n type, you can put components, meaning that that type has these components. So it's got real components, x, y, and z. I can take that a step further and say, it'd be interesting if I could have a type that represents a line segment. That's just going to hold on to two points, right? So now we have two points to find a line. I can go another step and say, I'd like to have a polygon, which is made up of line segments. And I can have an allocatable array of them. And now this derived type can represent something as complicated as an n dimension, uh, uh, a polygon. Uh, is the font too large that only a few weird words appear? Um, Okay, I'm getting a few. I got one that looks good, looks normal. I um, need something on my side, yeah. sorry. Maybe, maybe check your Zoom. Uh, like, I think I think it, it's possible to like zoom in on the screen or something in in Zoom. But uh, so j 
just double check that setting or something. Um, anyway, uh, so I can represent any a polygon with any number of edges with this derived type. This is because I can put line segments, as many line segments as I want into this array, and then we have a polygon. And then we can go even one more step further and a solid is just an array of the polygon faces, right? So, so you can start to build up these types that let you discuss in, in more succinct ways meaningful things that you want to talk about in your program. For example, solids. Some, I have some representation of a solid and I can pass around a solid as a single thing rather than in in older styles what you would have seen is you would have seen something to get as complicated as something like a solid you would have ended up with multi-dimensional arrays of x y z and then you're passing around or you know have as common block variables or module variables or something like that you've got these multi-dimensional arrays that you have to keep track of which value goes to which face or edge or point or Right, so you have to you have this uh, kind of administrative or just uh, you know keeping keeping track of accounting for how how is my data arranged in the the intrinsic arrays. Well, this allows you to not have to spend so much time thinking about just the accounting mechanisms. Uh, so we can pull up. The example in there, um, th this example doesn't have a main program, but we could try and do something like use, uh, what did I call it, geometry. Just none. So we can have a, a point. equals one, uh, and this is the syntax for component access. Uh, it's the name of the variable, percent, and then the name of the component that you would like to access. All right, so now we can start to look at meaningfully what are the components y and c y and z right, so now we can compile this program uh, let's go into the right directory drive types examples ftn components and you can see if we get X, Y, Z, uh, the components. Uh, you can you can chain your component access. So, for example, I've got a line. I've got my line segment. I can say that uh, L1 percent P1 equals P1. Or I can say L1 percent P2 percent X equals four five and six, right? And then we can do something like X equals L1 percent P1 percent X. Y and Z, Y and Z, and we can do again to see the second point. And then we compile and, oh, uh, L1, P2. Why does it think that? Ah, because I called it line segment. Uh, 
there you go. And so you can do assignment on whole derived types. You can pass them around to procedures, et cetera. So it, it's a way of kind of packaging up data and then having it be you know, a coherent thing that you can reference as a whole thing, take pieces of it, et cetera. So basically the gist is derived types have components that can themselves be derived types, et cetera, all the way down to intrinsic types. So uh, the next step is well, that's all pretty useful. What about some more complicated things? Um, you can do some interesting things with derived types. You can use uh, default initialization. So if, if you've ever had this bite you before, this is one of the, the aspects of the language that occasionally just bites somebody, everybody. Um, if you do an assignment to a variable in its declaration and it's not a constant, that implies that that variable has what is called the save attribute, meaning that if that variable is like in a procedure, that variable retains its value between calls to that procedure. For derived types, that's not the case. What this says is when I declare a variable of that type, before I've defined anything about it, it its component does have this value. So this allows you to get that default initialization without implying the save attribute. So let's go look at this example a little bit. All right, so let's have a program use default initialization. Uh, type counter. Uh, so we've got a counter variable before we've defined anything about it. So the, the language says that before you define a variable, its value is undefined, right? It could be random nonsense. But if you use default initialization for your derived types, the value is actually defined. And to demonstrate that it, we can give it meaningful default values, you can do things like this. And to demonstrate our uh, 2% count our 2% count equals 1 and print it again. So we'll call this twice and see that both times we call it this variable that component starts with the value that we defined in the default initialization, even, even if we change it later. So when we get back to that procedure, that, that type gets redeclared and starts with a new value again. If you've ever seen this before where you'll have an integer, right? And if you were to do the same thing with that, You'll see that this this is having the assignment on the declaration gives it implies that it has the save attribute, and so you'll see a different behavior with that. Right. So the first time we call it, it has the value zero, then one, then it retains that value on the next call. It doesn't get reinitialized to zero. This is this is a thing that trips everybody up at least once. So if you want to have default initialized variables, you can use derived types to accomplish that.
Next is the structure constructor. Every derived type that is defined by default gets a function defined implicitly that has the same name as that type and takes its components as arguments and returns a value of that type. Right? It's called the intrinsic structure constructor. The arguments for default initialized components are optional. Allocatable components are optional and pointer components are also optional. So for in this example, we define a derived type. It's got these components A, B, and C. Uh, I can declare a variable of that type and I can construct an object of that type to assign to that variable. And I don't have to give uh, an initial value to B because it's already got a default initial value. I also don't have to give a value for C and then it just won't be allocated. So let's take a look at that uh, structure constructor. Right. So FTN structure constructor, right? So this assignment from this structure constructor the value, the, the component A got the value 42, B was default initialized to 3.14, C got the value hello. Um, but like I said, we don't, we can do without C as well because it's allocatable. And then we can ask, was C allocated? And it was not. So the, the allocated intrinsic says false because it was not allocated because we didn't give it a value. And so this allows you an easier way than having to write out like we did uh, in, in that example or, I mean, that one, that was a simple example or something like this, rather than having to write out and do the independent assignment to each, uh, to each component, you can put it all on one line and do the construction in one line. Um, let's double check and see if there are any questions so far. I mentioned several advantages of including the procedures in modules instead of implementing procedures in uh, should de should be declared inside mo uh, should should we follow a similar approach with the derived type should they be declared inside modules uh, yes that is that is a good programming practice a lot of times especially if you use kind of an object oriented style you'll see a module just declares a single type and its type bound procedures which we haven't gotten to yet but we'll talk about that here in just a minute for memory alignment efficiency, is it was advised when using commons to properly set an order to reals, integers, and other intrinsic types. Uh, do you know if the compiler manages to internally reshuffle the memory alignment? Uh, the compiler is allowed to, uh, unless a couple of caveats. If you you can make types define C or uh, sequence types. There's an attribute you can put in the type definition. So if you say bind C, it's saying there is an equivalent struct defined in C. The, the caveat there, though, is that you can't have allocatable components and you can't have any components that aren't C interoperable. So you can, you can build up. But basically it's saying, I want to mirror exactly what I can do with structs in C, and they are they're actually equivalent. And so it, it, that defines the order that they must be laid out in memory so that they can interrupt with C. Uh, you can also do sequence. Uh, I believe that, or I think, uh, I think sequence might actually be a statement. Yeah, so, so if you put sequence in the derived type, it says that no, I really do want you to lay them out in these in this order, and then you can actually have separate derived type definitions that if they 
have the same name and the same components with the same names in the same order, technically those are the same type. So that you can, I, I don't know of many use cases where that's actually important or you really want to do it that way, but it's it's another aspect that says to the compiler, hey, I do want you to put them in the order that I that I provided them. But really, really the only the only thing that the order that you list them in the derived type says to the compiler is that's the order for the arguments to the structure constructor. Have derived types always existed in Fortran? Uh, no, they have not. They were added, I'm pretty sure Fortran 90, but definitely 95. Um, and then in 2003, we started to get some of uh, some like type bound procedures and some polymorphism. So you could actually do some of the things. They are not quite the same as classes in other languages. They're similar ish. We can define methods. They're called type bound procedures in Fortran and you can do some polymorphism. Uh, we'll get to that. We'll touch on that a little bit later. Is derived type with default values a better strategy? Um, my, it kind of depends on your style and personal preferences. If you have a style that is kind of more object oriented and procedural, where you'll occasionally be modifying individual components of your derived type of, of your objects. So, so when you, when you define a derived type, uh, the, the instances of that derived type are called objects. So when you, if you're gonna be modifying components of your objects like ind independently or modifying the state of your objects in some way, you really do wanna be careful about having default initialized values and be able to check, and in a lot of cases be able to check, has this value been initialized? Has this object been initialized and given some value because otherwise it might not be uh, in a meaningful state and I shouldn't perform whatever operation has been called. Um, is it possible to override the intrinsic structure constructor? That was my very next thing. Somebody was looking ahead. Um, so you can override the structure constructor. It turns out that it's a generic name. Uh, so if you've ever used uh, generic interfaces uh, for other procedures where you can define that a procedure, there's a set of procedures that can all be called with the same name and they're distinguishable by the types and order and number of their arguments. The intrinsic structure constructor is exactly that. There is no specific name for it meaning that you can overload it. In fact, you can actually just overload it entirely. You can actually get exactly the same matching interface. Um, but basically, if you write a function that returns, you, you can write any function and give it the same name as your type. And the typical pattern is you want it to kind of overload the structure constructor. So in this example, I've got a circle that's gonna have a radius, it's gonna have uh, components, radius, and area, but I actually wanna be able to construct an object of type circle given just a diameter. And so you write that function from diameter, say that it's callable with that interface, and then I can call, call that structure constructor w as if it was the intrinsic structure constructor. So FTN overload, right? And so it can, in fact, and so we, we say we've got a circle of diameter two. The constructor that I wrote will give a radius of diameter divided by two, and then the area is pi times the radius squared. So we get the right area assigned to it. And this will be important for the next step I will show you. Let's see if there's any questions on that one though.
functor like derived type. Uh, I'm not sure what that person means by functor like. There's there's a couple of different uh, ways that uh, people use the term functor, and um, so uh, you have to be a little bit careful about what, what specifically you meant there. Um, doo -doo -doo. I think all of those questions we answered already. What do we mean by override? Um, so for example, I've got, let, let's say I'm, I'm not going to define an area here. So the, the circle T only has a single real component. This function takes a single real argument. Meaning it has the same interface, exactly the same interface as the intrinsic structure constructor. So then the question becomes, okay, well, which one gets used here? Turns out if you do over, overload it, it uses the one you defined. All right. So a circle of, of diameter two has a radius of one, right? So when we say, when we say for, for the vast majority of cases, if there's a, gen, if there's something with a generic interface, you can't put uh, procedures that match one of the existing interfaces into that generic interface. This is a case where the, the language actually does let you overload the intrinsic thing or, or override the intrinsic thing. OK, uh, so the next step is type bound procedures. So uh, you can define procedures that are bound to the type, meaning they are functions or subroutines that look like components of the derived type. And you get what is called, by default, you get what is called the past object dummy argument. When you call a type bound procedure, the object you're calling it on, you, you call it with the uh, same component access syntax. When you call that procedure, the object that, it, that you're accessing that type bound procedure on is implicitly passed as the first argument to that procedure. The, there's a, there's a rule, and just to suffice it to say, the past object dummy argument for type bound procedures has to be declared with the keyword class instead of type. That there's reasons, there's reasons for that, and we'll go over that we can go over them, but that's just to suffice it to say when you want a type bound procedure, the past object dummy argument has to be declared class. That that's the simple way to just try and remember it. But what this lets you do is I can calculate the area later. So when we do type bound procedures, FTN type bound. In my structure constructor, right? So I, I've modified my circle example here so that it only has the component radius. In my structure constructor, I just assign to that component. And then I have a type bound function called area. So you say procedure. You have a contains statement in the, in the type. And then after that, you list its type bound procedures. And so you say procedure area. And then that says that the area function that is defined in, the, in this module, uh, that's another caveat. You can typically define derived types uh, just about anywhere. So you can define derived types in the declaration section of a program. 
or in the declaration section of a procedure or in the declaration section of a module or in the declaration section of a submodule. However, type bound procedures must be module procedures, meaning that you can't define a derived type that has type bound procedures in the main program because the procedures there aren't module procedures. So, uh, so that's the caveat. Uh, there's also a, a way that you can do a rename. So this is the name that uh, users of my type will call, and that's the procedure in this module that I'd like that to, to be invoked with that name. Um, so this is actually equivalent and, and will work. but it's just redundant. So a lot of times you just won't see that. Um, but any, at any rate, so it, the, the implicitly passed, passed object dummy argument is the first argument to that function. We declare it class circle. Uh, in this case, I'm gonna make it intent in, and then that function returns a real, the area, just the formula for the area of a circle. So then I can do the construction of my circle with a diameter and then calculate the area later. So that's what's happening is I'm calling the type bound procedure area. It's getting that circle as an argument and doing the calculation here rather than ahead of time. There are questions on that aspect. Why is it necessary to find a function with a different name in order to override the constructor? Couldn't we just directly define the circle t function? Um, no, because I'll give you an example of what will happen if you tried to do it that way. It's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, so let's try and just overload it here. Um, you'll see I'm already getting red squigglies from, from my editor. So what happens is I get name circle is already defined as a generic interface, right? Because I said, because I have a derived type, circle T is a generic interface. You can't have specifics with the same name. There's another, um, there's another aspect of this that actually comes in as well, but I don't think it's going to give me that error message here. Yeah. Um, so I don't get that error message in this case, but um, the, the type name and function names are in the same class of identifiers. So if I'm in a function with this name, I can't declare things of that type because the names clash. So you, you just, you can't do it that way. That this is just the short answer is you have to do it this way. If you want it if you want to overload the, the, the intrinsic structure constructor. Yeah, you have to have a function with a different name and then write this interface. Is the attribute intent in always required for procedure uh, something, the area function? Seems it's obvious that they are intent in. Uh, no, they do not have to be intent in. Um, but it's usually good practice for functions. It, it's usually good practice for functions not to modify their arguments because if they did, things would be weird. I can go change this this from being intent in to say intent in out and say self percent 
radius equals radius over two. Now, what will this print? Uh, oh, wrong one. FTN type bound. There we go. The standard does not say which order these are evaluated. So this is effectively processor dependent or undefined behavior or whatever you want to say. It, it doesn't say whether this one gets evaluated first or this one gets evaluated first. So most compilers will be consistent about their order, but you might switch compilers and now it prints them in the reverse order. So it's usually best practice not to modify a function's arguments because you'll end up with confusing behavior. That said, you might have a subroutine uh, set radius I'm going to make it type bound, so I have to say class. I can even say intent out. Oh, can I? I think I can. Uh, real intent in. If you take them out, wouldn't you create a new object? Uh, not necessarily. But it does, it does end up with some interesting rules about what does the declaration of the thing I'm going to call this on, what's it allowed to be? So class says this type or anything that extends from it. But if I say class and intent out, I can't call this on things that aren't declared as that either that type or class allocatable that type. They have to be declared exactly that that type. Otherwise, I could be trying to change the type of some object, and that's not allowed. Um, but at any rate, so you, there the the rules get a little weird for type type bound procedures. Uh, but in this instance, I'm pretty sure I can say intent out. The compiler will tell me if I can't. Um, but anyway, so I can change the value. I can use a subroutine to change the value set radius uh, oh, uh, circle percent set radius four, and then we can print the area again. Uh, set radius. Oh, right. I defined the procedure, but then didn't make it type bound. There we go. Uh, yeah, this is an error message you'll get a lot of the time. Uh, that is, I tried to access a, a thing on this derive type object, and it says is not a member. And usually that's a, uh, an indication that you either forgot to add it as a procedure or maybe you made a typo and didn't call it by the, the right name or whatever. Um, occasionally, it'll try and give you interesting suggestions of, did you, did you mean radius? Well, that's not a subroutine, so no, that's not what I meant. But anyway, uh, so, so we can change the radius of the circle by using a, a subroutine. Um, if you, if you want this style frequently, if you're just going to like set one component or something, you want this to be in out because you don't want the other components to be erased. Uh, because in out says that erase everything uh, on this object so that I can set everything. Uh, so frequently, you'll actually just want intent in out for something like that. But in this in this case, the the behaviors is the same. Um, okay, back to question. I can imagine the increasing the complexity of the language with these features may slow down somehow the speed of Fortran. Is this really the case? It occasionally can be. In most cases, the the 
code that you're going to write is going to be simple enough that it can tell what, in this case, like it knows it's going to call this function. It knows what function it's going to call here because this is not polymorphic. It knows what this type bound procedure points at. It could rewrite this to be the non the non object oriented style in all three of these cases. And so you probably won't actually see any performance penalty. When you start to do some of the more advanced polymorphic things, there's a little bit of overhead because it's having to do uh, like pointer lookups and things to figure out what procedure is going to be called, where is memory or some things stored, etc. So you you can have some performance penalty by using some of these features, but I will make the argument that developer time is worth way more than computer time. And so what, if this makes your project easier to understand, well worth it, well worth the overhead because it will save you weeks to months of debugging if you tried to do it without these features. So uh, don't, don't worry too much about any of the performance penalties, at, at least at first, at least until you've got some evidence that this is really causing you that big of a problem. But most cases, it won't. If two modules are used in a program and they have variables with the same name, can these variables be distinguished? Yeah, you can, you can rename them. You actually don't even need the only clause to do it. Um, so you can say, I'm going to use the things in this module but th this one I need to give a different name. You can, I, I like to use the only clause all the time anyway, but technically you don't have to do it to do the rename. The implementation of type bound procedures looks similar to Python's methods. Is this feature really? Uh, no, uh, type bound procedures were added. I'm not sure if they had looked at Python. It's unlikely. Um, but the, the real distinction about Fortran when it comes to like type bound procedures versus methods or, or what have you, whatever they're called in other languages, is that they're both type bound and not type bound. So I can make this public. And call it the other way. Um, oh, because I didn't put it on my use statement. Right. I can still call this procedure as though it's not type bound. And that actually ends up there, there are some aspects of the language that are a little bit idiosyncratic because of that. Be, that there, there are certain things that you can't really define in terms of a type bound procedure because it's not part of the type. It's I have to declare this procedure separately and then attach it to the type. And so there's some interesting idiosyncrasies, idiosyncrasies uh, as you started to get into some of the more advanced stuff. All right, I think that's good for now. So let's go back to our slideshows and take the next step. Hiding state. Um, almost every object-oriented programming book, course, tutorial, whatever that you'll find, says that best practice is that your components should be private. Fortran lets you do that too. And so you end up with a, I've got that circle example. So where, where we came from the last time where we were talking about type bound procedures, I moved area from being a component to a type bound procedure that get, can be called and calculates later. I don't have to change, at this point, I didn't have to change this code at all because I'm using an overloaded structure constructor and a type bound procedure. 
I don't have to change this code at all, and I can put private here. Private does two things. Outside of the module, nothing can access that component, right? So in places inside of this module, I can define procedures that can access that component. Otherwise, I couldn't write the structure constructor, right? Uh, and my type bound procedures can access that component. But outside of the module, I can't do I can't do that anymore. The compiler will yell at me about that now. Uh, FTN private, right? Component radius is a private component. So I cannot do that anymore. And in a lot of cases, that really is valuable. If you've got some complicated derived type that's got some interesting, it's got some components that need to be self-consistent, you don't want users of that derived type to inadvertently modify one of those components and leave it in an inconsistent state. You want them only to be able to modify things through likely the type bound procedures you define on it that can be written in a way that ensure that the object stays in a self-consistent state, right? So, so with, a private com with a private statement, I can say by default, all of my components are private. You, you can selectively make some of them public by adding public back to their declaration. Uh, but again, uh, best practice is usually you want private components. So that example can work exactly the same way it did before. I've got that structure constructor that I overloaded, and I can call the type bound procedure on it. And they can access the private component, but, uh, but outside outside of the module that can't. Um, the, other, the other aspect of if the type has private components, the intrinsic structure constructor is also not available outside of the module. So when you do this, uh, when, you, when you make the components private, if you want a structure constructor to be available, you have to define your own. A lot a lot of times, especially as like a project is just kind of getting started, you'll end up with a structure constructor that looks identical to what the intrinsic one would have been, but because you wanted to make your components private, uh, you had to write your own. Um, but like I said, best practice is to make this private because then later I can do this. And I still, I, I just changed, I entirely changed the internal representation of this derived type. But I didn't have to change anything about the code that used it. That's the, that's the benefit that private components gets you, is the external interface for the way that you use this derived type is the only thing that, it, that other people can use. They can't rely on your internal structure. And so you're free to change the internal structure whenever you want. I could, I could pre-calculate the area instead of calculating it in, in the function. I could make a new component, pre-calculate it in the structure constructor, and then this area function doesn't have to do any work. And so the, you, then you can make uh, uh, like performance trade-off decisions in terms of like, how often is my constructor called versus how often is this type bound procedure called that's going to do the calculation? Oh, well, maybe, uh, maybe I'm going to construct an object once and then call this procedure on it all the time. Well, I can change the internal representation to do that calculation ahead of time. And then when something external calls the, the type bound procedure, it's just returning a value that it's already calculated ahead of time. But the external world can't tell the difference, but you'll get better performance. So let's take a look at any of the questions there. Inserting the interface in the circle module that starts with, defines the from, the, is this function associated with the circle type or just some module function? 
And if it is just a module function, why do we use interface circle T? Why didn't we just type interface by itself? So it's, it's a slightly different type of thing that we're saying here. This isn't defining the interface for from diameter. It's saying the generic name circle T should also include this procedure, right? So we have to have a module procedure, this function that's defined down here, to put here. It's, so it's kind of the inverse operation, is we're not, this isn't defining the interface of from diameter, this is. This is just saying, I also want that procedure to be callable from here. You could make this public too, right? I could make that public. Uh, yeah, that's the one we're in. And the code still works the same. It's just kind of a convenient, or it's a, it's a convention type thing of, when I see the function, when I see you call a function with the same name as the type, I know what you're doing there. You're constructing an object. And so following that convention gives, gives uh, some meaning to people who come to your code later. It's like, oh, you're calling a structure constructor. Even if it's not really the intrinsic one, I kind of know what you're doing here. Uh, okay. Uh, interface, yeah, intentionally chosen to be the same name so that it looks like the structure constructor. Uh, what language is used to write Fortran? Oh, you mean like like the compilers? Um, well, the very first one would have been written in assembly because there was no other programming languages. Uh, and then very quickly, some of the Fortran compilers would have been written in Fortran because it was the only language. Um, but modern day, most of them are written in C++. That's where a lot of the tooling ended up for doing compiler development was C++. So that's, that's why it's so popular. Um, okay. So let's go back to our... I now have an exercise for you all. Uh, the derived types exercises, exercise one. Take a little bit of time and see if you can refactor this program that's just gonna calculate the perimeter of a triangle. See if you can uh, refactor this a little bit to make use of a derived type, i.e. make a point type that has X and Y components and then make a triangle type that has three points as its vertices, right? And so see if you can modify this program to, to work in that way. As bonus points, if you go ahead and define a type bound procedure that can calculate the distance between uh, two points. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and give a quick note on this one that this uh, modulo procedure is so that we get the wraparound behavior for an array. So I take the distance between points one and two, two and three, and three and one. So that's what that modulo is doing. In the meantime, I will go look at questions. That's a
All right. Uh, hopefully, you guys have a little bit of time to start playing with that. Um, I'll go ahead and go through the exercise as well, just to kind of show you the way that I might think about this. So let's move over to the exercises folder, compile the exercise, and see how it works. So let's say that the first one is at uh, 0, 3. Second one is at three, four, and then the third one is at zero, zero. It should be, if I recall, so three. Oh, I I know. Let's let's do the one that makes sense. Zero, th zero, three, and four, zero. And zero zero, that should be the perimeter is twelve, right? So three three and four means the hypotenuse is five, and so the perimeter should be twelve. Um, so that's the behavior of the program we expect to make sure that we keep. Um, I'm going to define a point type that's got x and y components. And so then instead of an array of x's and y's, I'm going to have a, an array of vertices, right? So see how I, I now end up being able to talk about what I'm trying to represent. I have, I have a place that I can put a name to what is, what is, the, what is the thing I'm trying to represent. So now I can say it's vertices i percent x and vertices i percent y. And then here it's vertices i percent x and vertices i percent y. And then Ditto that goes percent x. So that array index goes there. And they should be the same. All right, I should get the same behavior with that one change of taking what was two separate arrays and making them components of a type that then I make an array of, I should be able to get the same behavior. So 0, 3, 4, four 0, and 0, 0, and I still get 12. Right. But now I can say, what is what, do X, what are x and y for? Well, the, the vertices of something. Uh, for the bonus points. I'm not going to actually make it uh, type bound, but instead of saying distance between x1, y1, x2, y2, I can say p1 and p2. And now I don't have to do the component access. I can pass the whole point and only do the indexing once. And so my arguments will be type point intent in p1 and p2 and now it's p1 percent x minus p2 percent x and p1 percent y minus p2 percent y right and so now i've i've kind of moved where i'm pulling out the components so you could envision making this uh, more of a type bound procedure, but rather than go through the trouble of defining another module, I'm just gonna just gonna do it this way. So then we've got 0, 3, 4, 0, 0, 0, and perimeter still is 12. So we're still that still works. And then we can go ahead and take the next step 
uh, and name the triangle and say that it has that as a component. And then you could actually make the perimeter calculation a type bound a type bound procedure on triangle. Right, so this is kind of the exercise that you would go through in terms of defining these things. Or kind of refactoring existing code to say, oh, why do I have these arrays that are always going together? Or why do I have these variables that always go together? Well, that might be an opportunity to define a derived type that has those as components so that you can kind of go, oh, that, that I have a, a coherent thing that I can talk about now in my code. So, so that's how you would kind of go through the exercise and, and solve that problem. But uh, let's talk brief, I'll mention briefly uh, about type extension. So there's an extends keyword that you can use for a derived type. You can say that uh, my type extends from this other type. And when you say that, you're saying that I, it, it will get all of the same components as that other type has and all of the type bound procedures that it defined automatically. Um, and this allows you to do polymorphism because I can, instead of just accepting whatever type bound procedure that that other type, the parent type had, I can overwrite it. And this is where that interesting polymorphism uh, effect can come into play and is this derived type says that it has this procedure and it works this way, but I can extend from that and then override and make it do something different. And then you can defer, declare variables to be of class, the, the original type, but they can also, they, you can actually assign values that are of the extended type. Um, and so this is where the polymorphism as, aspect comes into play. You can also make types be abstract, meaning that it has, usually the, the reason you'll do this is you want to say, I want, I want types that extend from this one to have these procedures, but I don't have an implementation for it right now. Uh, and so what you end up doing is you, you have a, an interface block, but it says abstract. And then you define those interfaces and you can use the interfaces to declare deferred type bound procedures. Uh, all of this is advanced stuff and we could spend a whole nother tutorial session on all of the aspects of uh, object oriented polymorphism and the usages of that in Fortran. So when we're thinking about topics for a future tutorial, this could be one of those aspects is just let's go through all of the all of the patterns and use cases and things for the advanced features of the object oriented features of Fortran. But for now, let's move on and start talking about parallel programming. So Fortran has parallel features defined as part of the language. And we'll talk about that here in just a minute. But first, uh, the default environment in on Perlmutter doesn't support necessarily co-arrays, but we have two options for how you could kind of follow along with the and use the examples here. You can either do module load open co-arrays, and that's that's the runtime library for the parallel features that GFortran can use. And so then you can use FTN and then add this dash F co-array equals lib when you're compiling your code and it will compile uh, parallel versions of your programs. Or it, uh, it also defines its own uh, compiler wrapper that you could use, which automatically includes this flag. Or you could use the Cray compiler by using module load prg env dash Cray, and then the compiler wrapper will point at the Cray compiler, which does support uh, co-array Fortran by default. Then when you're running these programs to run them as parallel executions, uh, you use the srun command and 
tell it you're going to use four nodes with a process on each. And then tell it uh, the parallel features of the language just work for CPU programming. So just tell it that to use a CPU only node uh, like that. So I have a question for the audience. Uh, sh show of hands, does anybody know what the shortest con standards conforming Fortran program is? Just a little bit of trivia for anybody. You can drop it in the chat or, or raise your hand or whatever. Does anybody know what the shortest standards conforming Fortran program is? Get a nope, uh, no idea. It's three characters. End. End is a standards for conforming Fortran program. I I can demonstrate. Uh, let's make a new file real quick. That is a standards conforming Fortran program. It doesn't do anything, but I can compile it. Uh, shortest. And run it. It doesn't do anything, but it, it is a valid Fortran program. So that's the shortest standards conforming Fortran program. Does anybody know <laughs> what what does it end? It ends the program. the The program statement is actually optional. Um, but but the end statement is required. So does anybody then know what is the shortest parallel Fortran program that one could write? Knows again, it's the same. It is the same. Module load open coarrays. Ftn dash f coarray equal lib shortest. Uh, why did that not work? I swear I tested this yesterday. Well, that's disappointing. Well, um, let's use the Cray compiler. But why did module load? Oh, module load. All right, so I, I loaded the, uh, so I'm using the Cray compiler now, which supports uh, open coarrays, or which supports coarray Fortran. And then I will go grab the command that I'm showing here. And we use that. Allocated one nodes, asked, oh. Okay, fine. One node, four processes. It should run in a second. Unless, unless Perlmutter is being honorary today. But at any rate, uh, yeah, so so end is unable to create step for job. More processes require requested than permitted. Oh. Uh, what's what's your S alloc line? Uh, I only asked for one node and default of probably one process. So let's ask for more. Oh right, because it was a shared uh, queue. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Default, you only get one CPU. Yep, so if you want to follow along with this, probably going to have to go redo your salloc command, it looks like. 
nodes are ready for job. Well, almost. I need I need a prompt back. There we go. All right. So now we have the srun command should work still with one node for now. There we go. All right. So I ran four processes that do nothing. If you want to see what is the observable shortest program, um, not that one, uh, shortest, I can run it as just one process and it says hello, or I can run it with four processes and it says hello four times. Fortran is inherently a parallel programming language. It, it uh, uses two paradigms uh, for the programming parallel programming model, the first of which is called single program multiple data, SPMD, meaning the exact same copy of the program is run as uh, multiple times simultaneously. The other is called partitioned global address space, PGAS, meaning there are certain aspects where you can make declarations in the program where one process can access data on another process, partitioned global address space. Uh, the terminology that the standard uses is image for each individual process that's running, and then the partitioned global address space aspect comes about with co-arrays. Uh, but we'll start talking about those here in a minute. Uh, let's just start with what is an example that demonstrates that we are actually not just running the same program, the exact same program multiple times, we can do different things depending on the image. There's an intrinsic procedure called this image. So let's go look at the first hello example in the coarray examples. CD coarray examples. So, uh, so I'm again, I'm using the Cray compiler, uh, so I don't need any extra special flags to get it to compile. So FTN, hello. Oh, apparently I do. F coarray equals, uh, or I think, I think I just need dash F coarray. Oh, you need to reload the program. Of course I do. Module load PRG in the cray. There we go. I was not using the Cray compiler, which was the question I was about to ask, but. <laughs> Thank you for the heads up. Anyway, let's look at the Coarray example. Examples, hello. So we have uh, an intrinsic function that, that returns the number of the currently executing image. So this way we can see that we can actually do different things. We're not just running exactly the same program that's just going to do the same thing multiple times. We can actually start to make use of the fact that we are different images. So that srun command on my executable. And give it a second to Spawn the job. Running things on supercomputers is so much fun. <laughs> Slurm must be having a hard day. This should 
run. My S run is slow also. Yep. Uh, and with as many as PM seems fine according to MOTD, that could be. Uh, who knows? I, I occasionally get slow responses, but that's normal. Anyway, uh, we could see when it actually runs, we get different numbers printed from the different executing images. So one, two, three, four. I, I launched it with four processes. I get the response of the actual image that is reporting it. So we can at least tell which image we are. So what can we do with that? So what can we do next with that? Uh, we can do collective subroutines. So collective subroutines are intrinsic subroutines in the language that do communication between images. So something like co-broadcast says, take this variable on every image and take the value from image one and give it to everybody else, it's broad, uh, broadcast. Uh, Cosum says take the value in this variable on every image and add it all together and give everybody back the answer. There are variations of ways that you can call a handful of these different uh, subroutines. Uh, for example, cosum, you can say, I only need the answer on this image. And then the rest of the images are free to go on once they've contributed their portion. Uh, or something like that. And, and so the answer was only accumulated on the specified image. You can do, so you can do things like that. Um, Intel seems to have co-arrays built in. Yeah, Intel supports co -array. So the, the four compilers that support the co-array features are the Cray compiler, the Intel compiler, G4Tran when you use open co-arrays, and the NAG compiler, but only on shared memory machines. So, uh, but we're hoping that there will be a couple more come, come about soon that are also still uh, able to support it. So, uh, so let's see what these programs do. Let's go, let's go run them and see what they do. So the broadcast example is saying only image one is going to assign a value to this variable. Then it's, then all the images will call co-broadcast. And the second argument says, which image am I supposed to take the value from? And everybody else gets that value and then we can all print it. So FTN broadcast and then S run my executable. And hopefully Slurm can get a little faster at this and we'll, but we'll see what happens. Um, but you should, what we should see is that uh, we should just see, we should see this printed four times. Um, and so the, only image one did the assignment, but all of the images are able then to have get access to that value by using co-broadcast. So we said, hello world there. Um, then the other one was sum. So I've got a variable, an integer variable A. I'm gonna say A's value is uh, this image. So it'll get a different value on each image. Then we can do co-sum, which says across the images, sum them up and everybody gets the answer. Uh, like I said, you can do uh, you can add an extra argument, and then uh, different images only only that image will get the answer. Uh, but in this case, we want to we want to see what happens. So if I do ftn sum, and then the same s run command, we should see four plus three plus two plus one, which is ten. Right? We should see ten printed four times. Yep. So it is the sum across images. So those are collective subroutines. Let's see if we've got answers or questions so far. Looking at the examples, see some similarity with MPI. What would be different between them MPI versus co-arrays? Uh, a lot of implementations use MPI to implement the co-array features, but they don't have to. In fact, I've got, uh, an anecdote where 
uh, somebody was using open color arrays to write some color array Fortran code and run it on a big machine. And the, MP, the MPI implementation wasn't letting them scale that, that program to more than like a thousand processors. But the developer of open color arrays happened to have an implementation that used open Shmem instead of open MPI. So they were able to, without recompiling the program, just relink to the open Shmem implementation instead of the MPI implementation and scale out to 10,000 cores. So the, the biggest benefit though between MPI versus co is most people when they write MPI are writing two-sided MPI. That both of the images that want to do some communication or all of the images have to wait on each other before they can finish that communication. All of the co-array accesses in Fortran are one-sided, which is really hard to get right when you're trying to write MPI. Uh, so, so the biggest benefit is that it's easier to write better performing code with co-arrays than it is with MPI. To write an application that does the same thing in an easier way using, yeah, using co-arrays, yeah. It, there are a lot of things that are hard to do in MPI that are easier to do in co-arrays and easier to do faster in co-arrays, even though you could do them in MPI. How does the co-arrays feature relate to do concurrent? They're kind of orthogonal. Do, uh, do concurrent, uh, no. You don't need to use co-arrays to use do concurrent. Uh, only a single image will execute do concurrent. When it, when it gets to that. This image is analogous to rank. Yep, exactly analogous. How do we know what the built-in co-subroutines are? All of the collective subroutines start with CO underscore. Yep. Uh, but there, there's a list of them in the standard. So if you if you go through, uh, if you go, go to that intrinsics table that I showed you all yesterday, uh, that list has co some co-collective subroutines in the list, and they all start with CO underscore. Would you say co-arrays is like Dask? I don't have any experience with Dask, so somebody would have to explain Dask to me. But, uh, so let's go back and look at another example. Uh, so, so this is where we start talking about co-arrays. This is the, the PGAS aspect of, of Fortran. Co-arrays are symmetric memory accessible between images. And then so co-array access between images is equivalent to the MPI one-sided puts and gets, but with less ceremony and syntax. And so it's a little bit easier to get right. So let's look at the let's uh, let's execute this example to see what's what's going on here. Uh, so we declare a co-array by putting square brackets instead of parentheses. And then the star, uh, all statically defined, declared co-arrays, i.e. that aren't allocatable, have to be declared with their last co-rank as being star, i.e. the right number of, the number of currently executing images, right? because we don't know ahead of time how many images we're going to run. So uh, this says, I'm going to have this many images. And then you use the square brackets to access that data on a specific image. So this is going to say that every image is going to assign the string hello world to the variable greeting on image one. And then they're all going to print the value from the greeting variable from image one. And so let's go ahead and execute that and see what happens. Co-array, s run command. So we should see the four images that I asked for each print hello world. But they're only using the variable on image one. So they're not, they're not assigning to their own copy, they're assigning to image one's copy and then reading from image one's copy. But this only 
happens to work because the language says that each image executes these statements in order. So each, since each image is doing an assignment to that position in memory, to that, to that other image's memory, and reading back from the same thing, it's guaranteed that every image is going to be able to get the value because they've, they've done the assignment there. And they're all assigning the same value, so we know that they're all going to get the same value. However, it does not, what is not said is, what is the order? Which images do this in which order? There is actually a race condition here, right? If each image was trying to assign a different value, it is completely undetermined which image, what, what will the value be when this image goes to get it, because another image may have overwritten it, or which image, which value is, is present after the, at that point when the program's done running. So this is where we start to talk about image control statements and synchronization. If you want to be able to say what things happen in what order, you have to use image control statements. The simplest one being sync all. All the images will wait here until all the images have gotten to here, and then they can move on. So if we want to do something actually interesting in terms of like sharing data between the executing images, we have to do some amount of synchronization to avoid those race conditions. So let's take a look at this example with sync all. So we're going to say that only image one is going to assign. And here's, here's another interesting tidbit. If you leave off the square brackets when you're referring to a co-array, it implicitly says, it implicitly means access this image's uh, memory. So when when you're going when you're specifically just I want this I want to access my image's data, you can leave off the square brackets. And so that gives you a clue when you're looking through the code, where is communication happening? It's only happening in the places where the square brackets occur, appear. So only image one is going to assign to its location in memory that string. Then everybody's going to wait. And then only, and then everybody else is going to go get the value from image one and assign it to their location and memory. And then they'll all print it. And so this is how we can avoid that race condition. Because otherwise, image two might go try and get the greeting from image one before the assignments happened. right? Because image one, there, there's no ordering implied in terms of what order the images get to which statements. So we have to manually make sure that we're dealing with those synchronizations. This is the fundamental problem of trying to do parallel programming is you have to think about synchronization and making sure that the uh, the different images get to where you're interested in them being at what times you have to manually do the synchronization things but let's run this program and see what happens and you can see with that synchronization we don't get race conditions every image was able to print print the greeting There are more complicated synchronization things that you can do. The next simplest one is a statement called sync images. It says the, the image that gets to this statement will wait until the other images that are listed in this list, in this array, have also gotten here. And then, and they will wait, they, they will have this image listed in their list, and they'll wait, right? And so you can kind of get a looser form of synchronization by saying, I only want to wait on those images. And so as an, as an exercise, this program has a race condition. Uh, the last image that is executing will do this assignment, 
and all of the other images will try and get that greeting from the image after them. There is a set of sync images statements that can be added to this program so that it doesn't have a race condition. So as an exercise, there, there are three synchronization statements that are needed. See if you can take a few minutes and add the appropriate synchronization statements to avoid the race condition in this program so that you should be able to see however many images each image prints the greeting hello world if you don't if you haven't fixed the race condition it is unlikely that they will all print hello world it is highly likely that some of them will print an empty a blank string or maybe even just uh, leftover garbage because the assignment hasn't happened to that memory. So I'll give everybody a few minutes to kind of think a little bit about that and see if they can add the right synchronization statements to fix this program. Um, if, if you really want to be, um, There is a different way you could refactor this and just use a sync all, but that kind of defeats the purpose of the exercise. So, everybody, take a few minutes and see if you can work through this exercise, and then I'll, and then I'll I'll show you what the actual solution is.
All right. Hopefully everybody's had at least a chance to kind of think about the problem and maybe give an attempt at trying to uh, trying to solve it. Uh, so I'll go through the idea here. It, the idea is that we want to kind of starting with the last image, shuffle the data one image at a time. Like each image is going to copy from the next one. And so it's going to kind of, you're going to end up with this sequence of one image goes to get from its neighbor, goes to get from its neighbor, and then lets its neighbor get it from, from it. So the, the three synchronization statements that we need are, uh, we need if, right, we also have to consider the possibility that there might only be one image executing. Right? It is completely valid to run a parallel program with only one image. So we, we do have to, to think about that a little bit. So if, if the number of images is one, we don't want to have to wait for an image that isn't going to exist. So we say sync images. So the first image that does the assignment needs to wait on its neighbor until it moves on. Because when you do synchronization, uh, the, the pair of images that are going to synchronize both have to execute a sync image statement that is corresponding. So the next image, sync images, is going to wait on its neighbor to have gotten here, because that means that it's, it's got the data that I'm gonna, about to go grab. Right? So I'm going to go from my neighbor. I, I need to make sure that they've gotten the data, that it's, that it's ready. And so then once. I've gotten the data. Again, if this image does not equal one, I need to wait on the next the next person who's about to go come grab the data. Uh, because as I said, we have to have corresponding synchronization calls. But with those, we can if oh I missed a there we go. And then the S run command should allow this to execute. So this is a technique that you can use to stagger your network traffic a little bit. Right in in our initial synchronization uh, example here, we have this sync all. So chances are very high that all of the images are going to go and get data from that one at the same time, right? Because we just synchronized, so everybody's here. We're all going to go spam the network asking for data at the same time. This is a technique that you can set you can use to say, well, only one image at a time is going to end up going to get this data. So we're just shuffling it along, right? So this allows you to kind of stagger your network accesses. So you're not going to overwhelm the, the network infrastructure, right? It, if you see something like this of like, everybody wait, and then we're all going to go get data. If you're going to run this at large scale, 10,000 images all trying to go get data over the network might might overwhelm the network infrastructure. You might want to think about implementing some sort of some sort of algorithm that's going to let this be staggered. Um, real quick, as an as an illustration of what will happen if you don't do the synchronization, though, let's see what happens if we just run the original program. We should see a handful of the images print nothing or maybe some nonsense, right? A few of those images went and got nothing because the assignment hadn't happened. So that is the example of, that is an example of a way that you can do some of the more advanced synchronization. There are more 
you can start using the event type, uh, but that's starting to get more advanced. Uh, it's basically a kind of encapsulated semaphore technique. Right. So if, if you've done much other parallel programming, you'll know that uh, you kind of have have a have some place in memory that you use as a signal of like this image did this thing and then we can reset. And so uh, but it's a it's a good way of doing uh, a, a, an even looser form of coordination and synchronization. Um, there's an all there's also an even more advanced feature called teams where you can partition the images into separate teams so that one set of images can go do one part of the calculation while another set is doing a different part. Um, all of that stuff is starting to get more advanced into a more advanced uh, parallel programming course, so we won't go through all of that today. Um, so that covers all of the co-array features, so we'll go take a look at some more of the questions. So are there more questions on co-arrays? Um, could you explain the meaning? Uh, so the square bracket says that this is a co-array. Uh, the len equals is uh, the traditional way of defining character variables for since Fortran 77. Um, you, you have to define ahead of time how big is my string going to be. Uh, so you could, we could start getting into more advanced things, but for, for now is sufficient to just, let's, let's just make it the known length. Um, the star says that I am going to, there, it's, it's what's known as co-rank. So it's, since I, I'm accessing using the image index, so I need to know, well, how many images are there? But the program that you write doesn't know how many images there will be. You can't even, you can't know that at compile time. That's a, that's a thing that gets determined at runtime. So for co-arrays, at every point, somewhere there will be a star that says, this is as big as there are number of images. So that star means however many images there are. What are the drawbacks of using co-arrays when compared to OpenMP or MPI? Um, there are a handful of things that are a little bit easier to, that are, that are possible in MPI that may not necessarily be in co-arrays or may not be quite as straightforward. Um, but, but really the, the only downside is, yeah, that there are only a handful of compilers that support it. Um, can you point to a site with more examples? Um, let's see, you could go, I think there are some examples in the open co-arrays repository. I think there might be some examples here. Um, are there examples? No, maybe there aren't examples there. If you, however, I will say that if you want the quintessential example, this book, uh, Parallel Programming with Co-Arrays by Robert M. Uh, Robert W. Numerick, Bob basically invented co-arrays. So if, if you want the book by the guy who invented the thing, it's this one. And he's got some pretty interesting examples in there. So I can recommend that. Uh, site uh, book. Parallel programming with co arrays. There we go. Um, why is sync images needed? I thought only the lower image needs to wait for the higher one, um, but they have to have a corresponding synchronization. So when you do a sync images, both images have to have listed each other in a sync images statement that they are executing. 
otherwise it's uh, so right if we don't have this one then for example image 3 waits on image 4 goes and gets the data from image 4 and then doesn't wait for image 2 when image two gets here, it will be waiting here forever because image three never never executed a corresponding sync images statement. So you you have to have this one. Otherwise, otherwise this is this is a deadlock. All right. So that so that's the trade-offs between some of the more advanced synchronization features and uh, some of the simpler ones. Like, like if you do a sync all, like that's that's unambiguous. Everybody waits here until everybody gets here. But when you start to get into the more fine-grained, like I want to wait on these images, that's when you start to get into this possibility of, oh, I accidentally made a deadlock because image three didn't wait for image two. And so now image two is forever waiting on image three. So so that that's the trade-off, is it can be a little bit trickier to get some of the more advanced synchronization techniques to work properly. Uh, why is, okay, yeah, that's the one from the, from the chat. Um, well, I suppose if there aren't more questions, we can break for lunch a few minutes early. So I will give it another minute or two if anybody has a couple more questions, and then uh, and then we'll break for lunch. So thanks everybody uh, for being here. Thanks for all the interesting questions, and I will see you all after lunch. <laughs>